Thank you. So uh, we're thrilled to be here. We're learning a lot um, about a study that is becoming clear is really similar to our own. And I really didn't know much about the longitudinal study before um, we came here. So it, it's really been great to learn more about it and to see some of the research that's taking place with it. Um, it's great to see a lot of students using the data. We actually have fewer students using our data for reasons Katie can get into. But um, basically, the access process is much more difficult in the United States in a way that's not good. I'm not saying we're not proud of it, but it's slow and kind of hard. Um, so feel good. It's pretty easy to get this data, as far as I can tell. Um, OK, so this is a, the, I'm, we're going to be talking about something today called the Census Longitudinal Infrastructure Project, much like um, the ONS uh, LS. This is a um, joint academic government collaboration. You can see I'm at Michigan, Katie's at Census. Um, we've both been work we've been working together for, I don't know, 12 or 13 years, and we've been working together on this for the last maybe four or so. And up until a year ago, it was flipped. Katie was at University of Minnesota, and I was at the Census Bureau. And um, so now we're still working together, but you can see she is now the Census person. Um, so, okay. Here's what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about us, just in where we work, and um, kind of tell you the state of longitudinal infrastructure in the United States. It's a lot similar to the story I've been I've been hearing here, but it's, it's different enough that I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, how we conduct record linkage at the Census Bureau. Um, basically, we use some administrative data in, in service of our linkage that I think is pretty different from what happens here that I wanted to talk about. Um, and then Katie's going to jump in and talk about the specific infrastructure that we're building. Um, I'll sort of give you the spoiler alert. Our goal for, I don't know, five years, maybe 10 years, is to have as close to 100% of every census from 1850 to 2020 linked that we can. So this is going to be a multi-generational um, longitudinal infrastructure. And we're, I don't know, three years ago, that was just kind of a, a, a hope. I think we're actually on a path where we're going to succeed, but we, there's a lot of work before us. So Katie's going to talk about the state of the infrastructure right now, um, how people get it. So we are, even though it's, it's a patchwork right now, we don't have all the censuses uh, linked yet. We have quite a few of them. People are using it, and so that's where you can really sort of see how our data access uh, protocols compare to the ones that you all are using. And then our goal is to finish it. Okay. Oh, so I went to graduate school at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the 90s. I was a data guy. Uh, so just, I want, I've been hearing a lot about how hard it is to get and use the data. I want you all to think back. <laughs> it used to be harder. Um, this wasn't even linked data. This was just micro data. Um, this isn't me, but it may as well have been, except that that's a really awesome computer where he could load those those um, real to real tapes himself. Um, at Pittsburgh in the 90s, I had to send a mount command over the Unix mainframe and then call someone over in a different building and say, I sent a mount command, and he would go mount it on it. <laughs> um, and yeah, anyway, that was how it worked. Oh, and I had a five gigabyte allotment on the server, which was a huge deal. Like, they would call me every month and say, Are you done yet? We need that space. Um, anyway, I was actually using that, the 1980 census pumps, Katie, um, not in the 90s, Katie's <coughs> younger than me, but she used the time use survey um, in a similarly difficult way. It was hard, it was torture. Um, getting this data, finding the space to put it somewhere, analyzing it, you know, overnight, you get like a certain number of cycles, and it was hard. Um, but it was also hard because this was just cross sectional stuff, so a lot of people have talked about using the cross-sectional data. Um, because 
each file had its own layout, its own coding scheme. In some files, uh, min had a sex value of zero, and in some others they had a value of one. That's a really easy one. Occupational codes changed radically over time. Everything changed over time. Um, and it was hard. It was really hard. Um, and it's something I spent a lot of time doing the grunt work of just getting a string of censuses that I could do cross-sectional analysis over time. And a lot of people did. I wasn't alone. Um, oh, those are the code books from the different. So our Census Bureau made using confidential data, public use microdata samples from um, 1940, 50, 60, all the way through the present. Um, I used those, but every code book was different, every file was different. Getting it on load, onto the server and getting to analyze it was all a huge challenge. And um, so when I finished graduate school, I went to the University of Minnesota, and it's called this, you may know this, but it's called the SAR here, the Sample of Anonymized Records. These are called PUMS files in the United States, Public Use Microdata Samples. It's the same thing. It's anonymized microdata that you can use on your own computer. And I went to work on a project in Minnesota where the I stands for integrated, where we integrated all the data. We, all, we gave the variables the same names over time. So it was called sex in every sample, never gender. Um, we gave the codes as much as possible, the same values over time. Men were always a one, women were always a two. Um, we did integrated occupation codes when possible, although something like that introduces a certain amount of sloppiness that we could just document and make the originals available for whoever wants that original sort of unharmonized data. So this, I mean, I, was, I worked here for 10 years. Uh, Katie was there for part of that time as well. Um, and this was, I mean, I think really the process of doing this kind of work in the 90s was so traumatic that it was like there were a bunch of us. There was, this was sort of a mission for us to um, make this data easy to get and easy to use. And I say that because I, a lot of people here have been talking about using cross-sectional data. But also I think it's relevant to what we're doing now and what I think you're doing now, which is trying to accomplish the same thing with longitudinal data. It's really hard to use longitudinal data responsibly. And um, we're trying to make it easier, much like was done in the past with cross-sectional data. We should know you can go to ifms.org. All of this data is freely available to anyone in the world. And also, IFMS International has almost 100 countries of their microdata. OK, you all know. You're just all <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Never mind. <laughs> oh, that's what Katie said. You did it. Look at that. <laughs> it comes or, um, yeah, so it's all here. I'm actually going to talk about that for a second. Um, so, this data, a lot of it, not only is just kind of hard to use because you had to get the real ships to you and the codes were weird, um, a lot of it was completely inaccessible. Um, and this is, so, as Katie said, we did this not just for the United States, but for a lot of countries around the world. Um, this is uh, Sudan. Um, I can't remember which year this is. But this is how the wheels were stored. Nobody was using the data. It was completely inaccessible, and it was degraded. So we, um, University of Minnesota employees, went there, helped get this ready, shipped it to a firm in New York City that specializes in recovering data off of old media, sent the data to University of Minnesota, integrated it over time. We had multiple years. Disseminated freely now. This is public use microdata. This is Bangladesh. It looks like 1980. Same thing. That's mold. This was in very bad shape, but it was all recovered. And this isn't just countries around the world. This is a picture of a project that I carried out in 2007. This is where the U.S. Census original data is stored. And we, in the mid-2000s, the Census Bureau had made pump spots, which I already described. They had not retained the original microdata, not all of it. Um, it was stored on real-to-real -real tapes, just like you've seen a bunch of already. And we said, hey, can you try to recover the 100% data? Because there's a lot of stuff people are going to be able to do inside the Census Bureau that they can't do with the PUMS files. And you can monitor their access. And they have a great system for providing secure access to researchers to this data. And nobody had requested it. So for 1960, 70, 80, 90, the data was on reels, it wasn't even on a disk anywhere. 
And some of it was degraded, just like the Bangladesh state that you saw. So we got a grant to go down into this is a cave in Kansas. We worked in the cave for several months, recovering old data, scanning it. It was on microfilms, scanning the microfilms using, I'll show you. Oh, so there's a microfilm. That's the inside of the cave. Look at that gate. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we store our stuff. Um, this is how the microfilms were originally processed. This is the 1960 census. The Fosdick machines with an optic, this was a bubble form where you fill it in the bubbles with your pencils. This is how those bubbles were read. They were read optically with this thing that would shoot lights through the microfilm. And this was the modern Fosdick machine that we set up in 2007 where we scan the data, get digital images, process them to make a data set. We did that with the 1960 census. The other files were fully recoverable without this kind of intervention. But for 1960, in the United States, we were down in a cave making a new data set because the original had degraded. In 2010, um, I went to the Census Bureau. I left Minnesota. And um, I worked on the American Community Survey, which is it largely replaces the interesting parts of our decennial census. It's an annual survey of one and a half percent of the population um, that's got a ton of questions, and our decennial census now has very few questions. It's a short form only. And I started to work on the kind of things we're going to talk about, which is uh, linking data and providing linked data in secure facilities to researchers. OK, any questions so far? Sure, yeah. Um, so, I know that you, you'll be going to talk about that it's hard for us to get access to data, but do you, in the American, not have the legacy uh, that you can't make data available for how many years? 72. Yeah, it's a 72 year delay. So, the 1940 census was released in 2012, okay. and we're actually awaiting that since then. Any other questions? Okay. So there's kind of a big break in, I, of course, people are linking all kinds of data to everything all the time. This is, I'm going to have a couple slides just focused on linkage projects using decennial census data in the U.S. So it's kind of, it's narrow. But, um, and there's a big break in how this is done related to the question you just asked. Everything from 1850 to 1940 is public. Again, I don't want to make it sound simple. It was released as microfilms, just like the one that I showed you from 1960. And um, Katie and I were involved in many projects at Minnesota where we typed in samples from those microfilms and made available public use microdata samples. Um, it's great. People use that to do all kinds of things. It's largely in the process, however, I don't want to overstate it, of being superseded by um, geo full 100% files produced by genealogical companies for genealogical research um, that, uh, after I left, Katie and some of her colleagues brokered access to for research purposes. So they entered the files uh, largely to make money, and they provided them for research purposes to the University of Minnesota. Even with names, they can be shared under uh, usage agreements with data security plans. Um, <clears throat> so that's only been three, four years that that's been available. And there's a really exciting research coming out using, not only using linked 100% cross-sectional data, there's a lot you can do that you can't do with the 1% samples we originally made, but linking it. Um, this kind of has proceeded, so I'm a historian, even in the 60s, before people were really using computers for this work, there was manual linkage of the single census data taking place where you would take every one of them Boston in 1850 and try to find them all in 1860. First by looking in Boston and maybe looking a little further afield. So there's, there was already some of the best <coughs> research in U.S. social history was based on linked data, but they were tiny samples, not linked very systematically. Um, just in the past few years, when we have the, the genealogical data, this complete count, <coughs> it's opened the door for um, automated even these automated efforts with complete data, very low linkage rates. Um, 
maybe say between 1860 and 1870, you might expect to get maybe 10 to 15 percent linkage, even with the best linkage technologies that we have. And that's because there are so few linkage keys to work with in those old censuses. Like we don't have date of birth. I'm not sure people knew their date of birth. We have age. Um, so it's basically age, name, and state of birth. And some of our states are really big. Um, <coughs> so the number of unique cases you can get is small. So if you really want high quality links that you trust, you don't get many of them. And, and that's, that is kind of a nutshell of what is up with linkage during this period until the past maybe year, which is that it's out there, people are doing it, they have the data, they have the tools, and they're linking maybe 10%. Maybe 15 if you really if you really kind of widen your parameters a little bit and you accept that you're going to have some error. And that's it. So like the first part of every article is like, here's why it's okay that I lost so many people. I'm trying to explain the representatives of who you got, um, and only then getting to your analysis or longitudinal data. This oh, and there's also the other approach is to not even try to do everyone, but to do people who are easier to link, like married couples. Because you have more linkage keys, you have both of their names. Um, so you can look for them together in multiple censuses and do a lot better. But then you're writing an article about married couples, which is a new kind of problem, because it probably wasn't what you wanted to study. If it was, you're in business, because you can link them really well. Um, but if it wasn't, no. If you want to link uh, women from childhood forward, it's impossible. Their names change very hard. So. It's only been in the past couple of years that there are studies now that are bigger and more systematic trying to use more administrative records so that it's easier to do something like link women because um, you can observe them in their birth record and their marriage record and see their name change. Once you have that information, then you can really do pretty well in the census. Your marriage record, you've got that couple, so you, know, you have an opportunity again to use more linkage keys and get much better linkage rates. This is just going. Um, Katie and I are both on the board of a project that is um, I think shows a lot of promise for us to finally get to much denser linked samples with these years. Um, and so that's where the, that's the status of that research. <coughs> now from 1950 to the present, it's pretty different. This all has to happen, this is private data. It all has to happen within the Census Bureau, on census computers, census employees, um, according to sort of the rules of the Census Bureau, which is great. They have a great computing environment but it's just everything is harder and slower. And it's harder to disseminate when you're done. And census, they have a great linkage program, very high linkage rates. Um, usually from one census to another, from the 2000 to 2010, we link maybe 90% of the cases. And the reason isn't really that it's space age technology with record linkage, it's more that the linkage keys are better. We do have things like data birth. Um, and we, something I'll talk about a little more, we use administrative records to facilitate the linkage, sort of like they're beginning to do with the older historical data in a way that just change, it changes the whole ballgame. Um, one more point about this linkage here. The Census Bureau started this before I got involved, or Katie got involved, with 2000 and 2010. That's, those are the, prior to maybe two years ago, those are the only linked decennial censuses at the Census Bureau. And they didn't do this to facilitate research. They put linkage keys on these files so they could carry out the census more effectively, so they could use it for missing data allocation, um, basically for programmatic purposes. Um, you, they want to link income data from our tax service, from the, the Internal Revenue Service, to the American Community Survey, or to the 2000 census, not so they can do a research project but so they can allocate the income value if you don't report it. Um, so it's much more operational purposes rather than research. So they had a great linkage program. They have for many years, but it's not to support people like us. It wasn't until very recently. Did you want to add something out? <coughs> okay, the last thing I want to talk about is, is how we do it. So this is focused on that 1950 to the present, the stuff that happens inside the Census Bureau that's really good. That's where, where it gets really high linkage rates. Um, you don't have to read all this. This is more relevant in a US context where the question is always kind of close to the surface if it doesn't come up. Like, why do you think you can have all my data? What, what makes you think you have the right to do this? 
because um, most federal agencies don't. <coughs> the privacy laws in the U.S. are such that your data has to be shared. For one agency to share it with another, you have to consent this person. And, you know, that's difficult. It's difficult to get consent even if people want to. And a lot of people don't want to. Uh, the Census Bureau has an exception to that's called the Privacy Act. They have an exception to the Privacy Act where data with fully identifying information can be shared with them if it's in service of their goals, the goals of the Census Bureau, which are to produce statistics about the population and the economy. So it's kind of that simple. If they can justify a statistical need for the data, they can request it from any agency in the government, from any state. They can request it, but it's not guaranteed. No one has to give them their data. But in our government, even the ability to request it is it's not entirely unique. There's a couple other agencies with this kind of right, but it's pretty special. <coughs> and what this says is basically the reason they can request data is to make it so they don't have to bug the public quite so much. If we can use this data to create products or to improve value, you know, to improve missing data, to add value to our data products in a way that reduces burden from the public, we're allowed to. So we have a ton of administrative data. And um, as I started by saying, it's mainly for these kinds of purposes, for operational purposes, for making the agency more efficient. Just recently, though, we do have the authority to use it to conduct research, important social and economic research, which is what we're going to be talking about a little more. This is a sampling <coughs> of the data that the Census Bureau holds. This is in addition to census data and survey data. This is our tax data. Um, this is like housing subsidy data, um, tenant rental assistance data, um, <coughs> child care support. Medicare is everyone over age 65 in the U.S. gets Medicare, so we have a lot of information about who they are and what kind of services they receive. Medicaid is um, data that impoverished people under age 65. Um, not data, services that they have access to. Um, so you can see there's a ton of data sources that the census got, almost all of these originally, to support their surveys and make them more efficient and reduce burden on the public. Um, nevertheless, it's all there and can be used for research that's related to the mission of the Census Bureau. So um, Katie and I are going to be describing the frame of census records that we've created. But the frame, I think, is it's just that. It's sort of a trunk. And these are going to be the branches of the tree where there's so much more you can do um, when you link it all in. And it's, this is all linked to every census that we're going to describe already. Um, so here's how we link. The piece, so we have a homegrown software that has a name, but it's like a bunch of SAS programs and a C program and things like that. Um, we call it the Person Identification Validation System. It assigns a unique number to each person. We call it a PIC, a Protected Identification Key. And every file where I show up, I have the same PIC, if we did it right, unless there's a mistake. Um, but that's, that's how that works. So you can easily, it, it's trivial when the work is done, to find me in every file we have because I have the same, I'm assigned the same value on this variable. Um, this is, the Census Bureau initially developed this to unduplicate records, so in the 2010 Census, we had a lot of people who filled it out more than once, and we needed a way to identify duplicates. That's how this started, this, or the 2000 where it started. It's grown from there to be used to support uh, programmatic research and also uh, programmatic purposes and also research. And how we pick data, how we put these keys on data. This is based on the social security number. It's our social welfare program. Everybody uh, is assigned an SSN at birth now. Um, anyone who comes to the country is assigned one um, if they have a work permit. Basically, if they enter the labor force, if they receive any kind of benefits from state government or from the local government, they receive an SSN. This is not complete coverage, but it's pretty darn close. And that's our frame. If you don't have an SSM, we're not putting a pick on you. So I'll talk about that. That does create a little bit of bias. Um, 
So we have this big file for SSN holders that has their name, their date of birth, their state or country of birth. To that, we get tax data, and we add their street address, the place where they live, which we have every year, because we get tax data every year. So a year-specific street address. Yeah. And then we do some name standardization and some address standardization, so it's easy to work with this file. We call that the reference file. Every file we get, including the census, we link to this, this thing that's built of social security data and tax data. Because that links you to a social security number, and there's a one-to-one -one between every PIC and every social security number. Does that make sense? All right, I'll just maybe go through this kind of quickly. This is how we link, we, we can't compare every record to all the other 300 million records when we do this. We don't have the computing power. So we do blocking, which is what most people do when they do record linkage, where you say, well, I'm just going to look within these groups. Um, but we do five different blocks. <clears throat> so the first thing we do is we say, if we get your data with an SSN, which we often don't, like we don't, on the census, we don't ask you what your SSN is. So we don't always have this as a linkage key. But if we do, it's great. Because it usually works. So within that block, within the, the SSN, we'll go look at the, new, at the Social Security data and say, does the name match? Does the age match? Um, does the place of birth match? And we'll declare, you know, that, that's, that works really well. Then we'll look within the address, like I said. So we'll compare the 2000 census address we had for you to the address we observed in tax data. From the, two, from the year 2000, and we'll look at that and then say, does this person have the same name, the same date of birth, the same place of birth? Okay, and if that fails, then we sort of look nearby. If that fails, <clears throat> you look for everyone with the last name that begins with A. For me, Trent Alexander, we have an A block. So this is how we do it. We use all the data we have every time, but it's just a matter of which variable you privilege to reduce the sort of comparison space because um, we can't just look for every record and compare it to every other record. Too much computation. Um, okay, I'll try to go through this real fast. So this is Medicare data, like I said, this is a social program that everybody over age 65 is enrolled in. It comes with social security numbers. And with that data, when I try to put a PIC on it, it always works. Almost all the time, I find my PIC based on the social security number that I received with my Medicare data. Um, because those are good SSNs, because you get benefits from this program. People say that they, they give the, the program good data because they get something from it. The 2010 census, however, we don't ask SSN, but it's that address variable, so I, where we compare your 2010 census address to the 2010 tax address that we have, and look at the people and see if they're the same. They almost always are. 94% of the time, it's that block that's the key to our being able to assign a PIC. It's not always the same, because whatever, not everyone, you know, people move, things happen. Um, <coughs> but you can see we get everyone, most everyone else, by looking nearby or by comparing, uh, by, by restricting the comparison space to their first initial of their last name. So we pick, as I said, about 90% of the records in these files. Um, these are just uh, surveys that we conduct at the Census Bureau that use the two decennial censuses that have the whole population. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of cut to the chase on this. These, the picks we assign, we use very conservative techniques. They don't really have errors. They're very small. We've simulated them and you can, these are, the links we make are very good links. That is not our problem. Our problem is bias because the links, we only make a link if you have a social security number. And if you don't have a work permit, you don't have a social security number. Okay, so we do really well with these groups. Good for us. Not as well with these groups. In fact, this group, we don't pick a single one of them. If you use our data, our longitudinal data, they're excluded from your analysis because we have no way of linking them reliably. Okay. And this is my last figure. Um, kind of forget about the, don't try to read the small words. Here's the takeaway. For us to, to link a case, 
we basically have to observe it in our administrative records. If we don't, we're not linking it. This is administrative records coverage. Purple coverage is extremely high. People who live in these areas, we will be able to pick because they exist in our administrative records. We can see them. People in these areas, more immigrants, less English speaking, much lower levels. They're still high, so this is mostly somewhere around 80 to 90 percent of the population we can see in our administrative records. Um, this is based on the maps between the census data and the administrative records data. But I guess my point is that this bias I was describing isn't just by individual level variables. There's a clear geographic bias in who we're able to link because of the way we link. Okay. So I'm going to leave it there. Unless there's any questions. Right. <laughs> anything about that please um so i'm gonna uh, yeah 
I'm glad Trent like introduced us. This is good. As you can tell, we have a long history. I'm pretty new to the bureau. Trent hired me, and then he left me, much like he did at IPMS as well. <laughs> but we still work together, right? We have this long, drawn-out history of doing very cool stuff, and I'm excited to talk more about it. Like I think we're we're making our way and and doing a lot, and that's partly what we're going to talk about. We've been collaborating in different ways through university and government partnerships for a long time. Um, so it's just sort of fortuitous, actually, how it all worked out timing-wise. Um, so, and one of the things that we have been working on a lot that we've talked about, right, we have this 2000 and 2010, but the other big innovation was adding is 1940. So the 1940 data became public in the U.S. in 2012. This is an image of it. All of the images went online. Um, this was a pretty big deal. We had a big party when I was at Minnesota, right? I mean, obviously, we all dressed from the 40s because um, it was cool. So Minnesota has the 1940 data. They worked with Ancestry.com to get it. Um, there was money exchange, there was entry. And then the Census Bureau worked with them to get it, and then trying to get in, try to link it into our infrastructure. So link it in, get these pics on it. However, right, we definitely don't have SSM back then, and we don't have birth date, which is kind of a big deal on the individual level. So what we use are names, and then sex, age, state and county of birth, and parents' names, which is a really big deal for children, and where people live. Um, it's a little bit different than these other ones because we, that are classic, it's, it's really different than using 2000 and 2010. So we had to really change how we do things to try to identify people in 1940. We also were really hopeful we could do better than some of that historical linkage that Trent was referring to, where we get about 10%, sometimes even like down to seven. I mean, those, they're also messy, those older files, they're hard to read, it's really inconsistent that you get names right. Um, so we've changed stuff here to make it work for us. And this is what we got in 1940. So we have everyone in 1940. On average, we got 42% of the population. So not like in these 90s of modern data, but you can see for the children, for the young people, we're getting about 75%. So it doesn't quite look like that there, but that's what it is. So it's 75% because we have those parents' names. So we're able to use their parents and them to find them. So we are linking 40% of these people into our system so in with pick, and then we can link them forward. Um, and then as it gets older, it gets lower. So here are the numbers. So 1940 to 1940, we have 53 million cases. So this is a little different than where, like, your study, which is about 5 million. We have 50 million we can link in, uh, or that have a pick. When we link them up to 2,000, we get about 26 million who are still alive there, uh, 15 in 2010, and 3 million into our American community survey. So, uh, so this is pretty exciting. Um, this was really exciting for us, but also really excited in the US because there's a big renewed interest right now in early life conditions, later life outcomes, social mobility, um, things like this. So this is, this is going to facilitate a lot of research and that's what we wanted to do. So now we're talking about 2000, right, 1940, we have a big gap. You guys have some nice spots there in the middle of that gap. We have a big gap. So as Trent mentioned, we digitize data for 60 to 90. We have the full long forms for most years. They were recovered in the early 2000s. It's restricted data. I'll talk about researchers can use that. I'll show you how. Um, but we don't have names on the digitized data. In most cases, we don't have address even all that well, like that are digitized. It's really difficult and expensive to add names by hand. I mean, just doing, like, which is why they were not added. Um, when we have names, though, then we can put a pick on these and link them to other things. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> what's next? <laughs> so what's next first is the 1990 Census Name Recovery Project. 1990 is sort of the next one. It's the easiest one, and I'll show you why. Um, and name, partly because names were handwritten on our forms. Let's show you it. And we have these forms on microfilm reels right now. And most of the other variables are already ready in the microdata file. So this is what it looks like. This is the form, people filled it in. That's their last name. All the names are there. So we need to capture all of those names. And the big key here is that they also have a person number. You can see up top it says person one, person two, person three. That we put in the microdata. So we have that order in the household in our microdata. And the other thing we have is this household ID. So if we can capture the names their person number and the household ID, we can link them to the microdata we already have. So we did a test to do this and see how much it would cost to see what would happen. 
So this is, uh, we did tested two scanners. This is the one that Trent showed you before, over there, like the same as the Fosdick, and then a new one, the Eclipse one, old technology. Um, and what we did is we took 40,000 cases across multiple reels and had people hand enter them into this app. So that was our truth data. So we had just people at the Census Bureau hand entering them. And then we tested out two optical character recognition companies. So right, this is where the image, the computer, is grabbing the name and then turning it into letters for them. So we gave them 20,000 cases as training data, and then we took it and we ran it on our other 20,000 cases to test them. This is what we got. Uh, we think this is pretty good. I was not optimistic about this. I will, I will admit that. I was very, I don't, if any of you tried them, like the over-the-counter OCRs, like I tried this on a PDF and it was like absolute shit. Like, did not, I mean like, I think if we got like 6% and we were like screwed and we, and we stopped, right? This isn't gonna work. So these we gave to some like pretty high-tech level companies and they got household ID 85% of the time, first name and last name close to 70%. So we think this is pretty good. It, in the end, something else happened that makes this extra good. And that's, that we found a digitized list of addresses for every house in the 1990 census. So we have street addresses, rural routes, apartment numbers, and we think we can actually use this without the names to identify anyone. So we have a project right now, Trent and I with some other people, where we're not even using like the names at all, and we're identifying people using our administrative holdings there, so using the tax data um, in 1989. So this is really exciting for us. We're really hopeful that in the next couple years that we will have a 1990 file to share with people. Again, it probably won't be the where we are with 2000 and 2010 in terms of percent wise, but, um, but people are really excited about this, right? We have another time point. So that's sort of our big infrastructure stuff. I'll talk about our next round and future plans because that's what we've done so far. Uh, but now sort of about how we get this data, right? So now we have all this data. We've talked about the Bureau can use it. Can researchers use it? Well, the researchers have been using linked census data for a while. So we actually have linked employer-employee census data coming from the state, our state, the 50 states on employment files, linked to business data. So the Census Bureau in the US actually does a ton of business stuff, not just demographic. And those have been available to researchers for a long time. Also, it's pretty common to use linked data across surveys. Things get a little funnier with the census in the U.S. because they're mandatory to fill out, which they probably are here too, right? Mandatory, yep. Our surveys are optional. So they feel like, so people opt into being linked. They even let, they even have to uncheck if they don't want to be linked across time. This is, that's a really easy thing. Mandatory surveys, the census is much more, like they're very serious about it. Even though this is completely protected, their names are stripped off, the addresses are gone. It's still, you need a lot of permission to use them even within the Census Bureau. Obviously there's some technical issues that I've alluded to here, like we don't have all of them, but even with the ones that we have, they've never been available to external researchers until recently, at all. So you had to be a Census Bureau employee to use them. However, then came along the Census Longitudinal Infrastructure Project. So Trent was on the team that created this, and what it did is it worked on linking the mandatory response and survey data, just like we did with 1940 there. It integrated this with extra data, the list that Trent showed you. <coughs> and then it's using it to sort of create this panel, and it's supporting research projects through Census Bureau academic collaborations to do this, so to do research using it. So this is pretty, it's very, ooh, this one too. Yeah, so this is why it's good, right? Yay, this is great. We had to sell this as good to the Bureau. So actually all research, I'll talk about that, that goes on with the restricted data has to benefit the Census Bureau. People write like 10 page statements about how their research is going to benefit the US Census Bureau. And basically what we're saying as Census Bureau employees is that we would do this research if we had time. But instead this academic collaborator is gonna do it for us. So it's a pretty big, it's a big ask. So this is why that we sort of sold this to the Census Bureau to help them and help with linking. And that started, Census approved it in 2014. Um, that right away there's a group, there's a governance board that runs it. Our first projects were approved early 2015 and there were publications out by 2016. So um, people are clamoring to get this data in the US. I get probably, I don't know, an email a week, email every other week uh, asking for it. So this is the core. So you saw that 2000, 2010, 2001 through present, and 1940. This is sort of our core of CLIP, the Census Longitudinal Infrastructure Project. But as Trent mentioned, 
this is where what else sort of happens is that we can link in other census surveys, so other surveys that we do at Bureau, and we can also link in our administrative records, so that Medicare, Medicaid, and then other data such as well. Um, so this is even like we have long running panels run by universities. Anywhere where there's like PII, we can bring it into the Bureau and link it in. So if you have a small different schools, things like that. Also, we're really, we're hoping and planning to link in that 1850 through 1930 data. So Minnesota recently got a grant to finish or to work on that project to link across. Trent and I are involved with that still as well. So we will, this is sort of our big full clip infrastructure that we're building. We have nine collaborative research projects and they're working out of seven federal statistical research data centers and I'll talk about what that is. So that's how people are accessing this data. Uh, these are the projects. You can see in them a lot of mobility, migration, immigration. So as we talked about, immigrant intergenerational incorporation, gentrification, stuff we've actually heard about here, right? Things that we're doing, you guys are doing with the data here as well, the samples. Um, this is what's sort of going on with the full data we have. Some different policy impacts. Loads of people want to do stuff, right? All different across fields, um, across all sort of social science. Here was our first uh, an MBR working paper on intergenerational mobility that came out in 2016 and it got covered in the news and then Trent and team just had a demography paper published on second generation outcomes of um, movers in the Great Migration. The Great Migration covered in the news there. So this is really exciting for us. So part of this pilot project was to show this was feasible and that good research is coming out of it and that researchers are really responsible and can handle this data and that the Bureau can handle it. That's, that's a big part of what, of what we're doing as well. Um, so how people access this data and other restricted data, it's slightly different than you guys, what you have going on here, but similar as well. So a federal statistical research data center is probably like you have here, it's a computer lab, right? And there's no internet in there, and there's computers that you can work on the data in a pretty difficult Unix environment. Um, but they're US Census Bureau facilities hosted by research institutions. So hosted at uh, universities. And universities pay a big part of the fee cost for it. Uh, but the Census Bureau directs all the work in there and there's a Census Bureau employee at all of them that's running them. So here's where they all are around our country, which is kind of big. I'm the middle one. So I run the, the Boulder RDC and work in the middle of America. Uh, but there are lots on the coast, you can see. I literally, we have people, I used to have people that live there that would travel all the time. Fly to California, fly to DC, would drive to Kansas City all the time, down to Texas. Uh, so people go to these places and work with the data there. We do not have an option like you have, where this is like very encouraging and interesting to hear, where you can like send them code later. My people have to go and do all of their work in there by themselves. Um, we don't do anything as on-site employees. We don't like get their data ready for them. You just get access to like the big data files that you have approval to use, and you have to run wild with it um, on your own. So it's a little bit different model than here. And every project has to have a formal approval process. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, most people have a big thing about how it benefits the Census Bureau. You also just have a big research proposal, like you with the Census Bureau and any other agencies whose data you're using. Um, so the IRS or whoever has to approve your project. So it, it takes people like six months to a year, about, to get it, to get <laughs> uh, And part of that time, though, is spent also doing going through a thorough background investigation. So, in, you mentioned like you had to do like three trainings. Oh, that's nothing. Yeah, I tell people to do like a half day or a day. There's trainings, you have to get fingerprints, there's a background check. Um, so, you're basically becoming an unpaid federal employee. And so, it's a costly investment. This is like a sense of your making investment. This also means we want you to have like a big, good project. So, people come in there, most people do their research out of there for at least five years plus. They get a bunch of papers out. Um, there's some pretty high level work that comes out of there. People that do it as students, they usually place really well. Uh, it's good stuff. All results are formally reviewed, just like they are here. It sounds like there are people here on the disclosure review teams. We also do that too, so everything goes through disclosure. There's no intermediary output here. You're not allowed to do output and do analysis outside. So it all has to be in the form of final um, tables. So what are we doing now? What are we, uh, what are we getting excited about? Well, these pilots have been been awesome, kind of. Like, they're, people are getting really excited. People want to do that. This is, I mean, as you guys know, that they, like, this is cool. 
So we're trying to get them sort of formalized so that anyone can do it and we can expand access to anyone. We're also improving the 1940 data. Trent and I have a project recovering some historical tax records in the middle of this period, so from 1969 to 1989. So that's pretty exciting. We would like to recover the 1960 through 1980 decennial data as well. So we're in talks with um, foundations to get money to go in and scan those images again, get names, whatever we can to link those to the data we already have. And as I mentioned, link in the historical data going back to 1850. 1850 was our first microdata in the US. It's our first, it's not true. It's our first individual level microdata. Before that, the census was just household level with counts of people in households. So that's our first sort of individual line one. I think your guys' is 1871. Is that your first? 41. Um, data delivery improvements, uh, public metadata, improved documentation, <coughs> helpful data processing tools. We're trying to make it easier for people to get access, and then once they get access, use the data. It's pretty hard to use. This is big. It's difficult. Um, it's really difficult in our computing environment. Since I've been sitting in this room, I already like leaned over, and I was like, wait a second. Once we have all the data, could we make like a public file of linked data that's anonymous? It's been kind of inspiring. That's now in the back of my mind. It's a little further out, but that's that's there. So that was like a big one. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Um, you said the products have to benefit the census bureau. Mm -hmm. um, one of the conditions we have of, of the usage here, mm -hmm. it gives reasons for, for doing research, and it says you can challenge official statistics. So you could do oh. you could do research that with the LS legitimately to demonstrate problems in the LS. Okay. Would challenging the Census Bureau be in order to improve in the long run your statistics? Six. Would that come under benefiting the Bureau? Kind of. So we have thirteen criteria. So we sort of give it to you. We say we have these thirteen things and we'd like you to pick some. So one of them is like improving our data, yeah. improving our weighting methods, improving our imputation. Um, telling, helping with, yes, like if something is wrong, or there's, there's a whole project that's telling us how we like do, do our geography incorrectly. Okay. That they think that, and that, that is really their whole project, is talking about how the geography is, they don't think it represents well. Like how we do our census geographies is wrong. Um, so uh, yes, I think that is in there. But we, we do give, we have a list of it, and one of them is making, like giving information about the population. There are some ones that are pretty easy to get, and then there are some other things that are a little harder. And we, that's what we also, that's part of the role of these FSRDCs and the people working them is to support researchers doing it and help them write these statements. Yeah. Can you put your big data into the top yeah. of I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but sure. Big. So that, the map that I have, where some of the country was yellow and that was bad and some of the purple and that was good. Um, what that, that was the result of a project like you're describing, where we took the 2010 census, matched it as best we could to our admin data. And those yellow areas were, were where we had a bunch of people in the census who weren't in the admin data. We have no way to represent them other than to conduct a census. Um, now, we could work harder to get more admin data. Uh, we, as I said, all we can do at the Census Bureau is ask. Some states say yes, some say no. A lot of it is at the state level. So we could probably do better, and you might be in a position to do a lot better than we are if you have more of a federalized system of administrative records. Um, but right now, in the United States, no. We need a census. Do you find it also the other way around, <laughs> <laughs> that, that you've got people in the admin data that are not 
maybe a little bit of that, but. It's a great question. How do you answer that? I don't. I just watched the IRS give a talk, and they they didn't get much. They didn't find a lot of like people paying taxes that were in the census. Um, I, I think there's another thing going on though that didn't come up there that could be for you too, which is that it, I don't think so. Right now, the, our census is a short form, so it asks very few questions. That's one thing to replicate. It's another thing like the long form of that ACS, which also comes up too. It would be really hard to get all the questions there. I think from a lot from administrative sources, not all of them, but a lot. I. I think that actually, right, the Nordic countries that do all admin records, when you talk to their researchers, it's sort of amazing, but then sometimes they hate it, right? So, like, they're talking, like, I come, I do some research, right, on, on contraception stuff and birth and fertility, and you can see, right, in their stuff, who's going to get contraception, who gets it from, but that's if they get it, like, from these certain places, and they have the records, and there's, like, and you're not getting, like, fertility, like, it's tough, like, they're, like, frustrated, like, they wanted some survey questions, and I, and I can see that that's where also things, I think that it could be a loss of research if we get away with, from all of our surveys and just go to admin data, it sounds like they're facing that up there right now. There's some really great things about it, and then there's some really difficult things about it. Yeah. Part of that, I don't need, um, because of the cost of doing the census in America. Yeah. <laughs> Be, that they're working on what? On getting rid of it? Yeah. No. No. I mean, like, it's mandated. They have to do it. It's in our constitution. It's a pretty big deal. I mean, like, that West Wing thing, they tried to actually that episode. Was like, can we switch to sampling? They can't. You know, they're like, I, I think they're counting everyone. They're not getting away from it. There are some cost issues. It's, that, that's another. What was that? We got rid of, so we used to have uh, the long form. Uh, six of the population got a long form, which was like 28 pages of detailed questions. We did away with that. In 2010, it's just 10 questions to everyone. So that might be part of what we referred to when that happened. But ending the decennial census, I don't think is in the cards in the short term. No. I guess in the UK, we have a sort of feasible spine from the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. So you know, yep. everyone, you know, if you're a new immigrant, you will sign up the National Health Service straight yeah. away. So if you were born here, you were born into the yeah. National Health Service. So there's yeah. not that many people, I think, in the UK that aren't yeah. you know, signed up. Which is maybe why, I mean, you guys have really high linkage rates, it looks like. I mean, we don't know any of that on us. I mean, the people that do the linkage now, but we, like, it just looked from your numbers, like, whoa, that's, you guys have a lot of people. Yeah, just uh, follow-up mm -hmm. to me, I think the plan was for the 2021 census to be, uh, to take as much from the admin, but time moves on. So now the plan is for the 2031, that ONS will use as much as they can from the admin, but they'll have a separate survey to sort of calibrate all of the missing stuff. Yeah. And then that, that survey might be, say, 5%, I'm not sure exactly the number, but just in the same way that the census mandatory, they make that survey mandatory, and then all of the stuff would come from the admin scales mm -hmm. that would feed into the, the equivalent of the census. I think that's the current plan, but, you know, who knows? Um, so the link data right now, we're not taking any more pilots. If you're in the US, UK, wherever, it doesn't matter right now until we have like a more formal process. In terms of getting to the restricted data in general, you can be, you can be anywhere from anywhere, but you have to be working in an RDC in the US. So if you're associated with one of those universities, you can, or have a research partner there, you can. Um, so I definitely, I've said this too, I have US citizens that live over here that are still on projects. Right, and like come back and have people there. I have four nationals that live in the US and are at a university and go in and use the data too. So it, it's like very, so from here, I mean, I think the easy, if you really want to do this, to find a partner. Yes? It's actually three. three. It's actually not consecutive either. It's three years in the last five. Okay. Right. So that is, that is a rule. Um, but it's, okay, so it's a rule to, for you to like go in and access the data. So if you really wanted to do something, which I can see like, or, or something, if you had, uh, you can definitely be on a research team 
with someone who else who goes in and does the data. So they do the data work, you can talk to them about it without talking about numbers, they can do all the analysis and bring it out and you can like write a paper on it and you can be involved in that way too. So I have a couple people like that, that they're on research projects and they live over here, but they're not, right there on the papers. We're not like telling you that the Bureau like who can be on the papers, but they have a partner over there that's doing their work. Hi, uh, um, <laughs> No. <laughs> a, list of, a list of eligible partners? <laughs> yeah. We're we not a dating service. Well, but <laughs> we, um, if you do a little Census Bureau researchers or something, there are. There, there's a website that lists everyone who, it, it, they email all staff at Census and say, hey, if you're a researcher, sign up for this thing. Yep, I'm and it there. says your background and your interest and what you do, and that's the closest thing. Yeah, have like a list. Census Bureau one. Mm -hmm. um, that's not about it. Because what we say,